Good morning, everyone. Today is Easter, and that means we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you're joining us for the first time, things may look and feel a little bit different than a normal church service, so feel free to engage however you'd like. You can sit, stand, sing along, take notes, or interact with others in the comments. Right now, we're scattered around the area, gathered in hundreds of homes, but the same spirit connects us all. Let us now sing to the Lord and celebrate because the King is risen.
Father, thank you so much for your victory that you have over death in the grave. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes, to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word, from a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt.
Father, we praise you. We give you honor. Father, thank you so much for your music, for your praise. Now speak to us, Father, through your word in Christ's name. Amen. Many of you probably remember December 7th, 1941. It was the time in which Japanese forces decimated us at Pearl Harbor. But what you might not know is the battle at Midway, six months later. It was a critical and decisive battle. By all estimations, it looked like Japan had the upper hand on U.S. forces. But the battle turned in one of the most defining battles in the history of our country. In June of 1942, Japanese forces looked like they were going to overtake U.S. forces at Midway. It was a critical and strategic place, one that would give the Japanese Imperial Army an opportunity, an edge to eventually attack our West Coast. But because of strategic forces within our U.S. Navy and cryptologists, they were able to decipher this surprise attack by the Imperial Japanese fleet. As a result of that, they turned away the Japanese fleet, and U.S. forces in that defining moment changed the course of the Pacific battle. There have been times like that throughout history, defining moments, strategic times, days that in a single moment changed the course of history. 2,000 years ago, something just like that happened. In fact, something much, much greater. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was the day that changed everything. On that day hinges all of our Christian faith. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and all of the disciples, as we see them empowered by the Holy Spirit, go forth declaring the name of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so today, on this day, Easter Sunday, we stand in the great tradition of a day that changed everything, a day that forged a new kind of way of life. Christianity was born because of the birth of Jesus Christ. Christianity was born because of the death of Jesus Christ. Christianity was changed and forged because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
And that's what we celebrate on this historic day. It's Easter Sunday, and while the church is empty, so is the tomb. And we see the power of the resurrection all over the place, all around us. The church gathered frequently is now the church scattered. And God is calling us out into the community in which we live. When we see the gospel accounts, we see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they're very specific about the events leading up to the death of Christ. And they're very specific about the accounts that are given. We have 10 eyewitness accounts in scripture concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what you might not see is what the book of Acts records for us. Over and over we find that Acts gives a story of the resurrection power of Christ. In fact, Peter and John are preaching the gospel and they are sharing the gospel in such a way that it's drawing a lot of attention. And, and in fact, they, they've healed this man who has been brought to the gate called Beautiful. And as a result of that, this, this man who's there begging and asking for alms and asking Peter and John for alms, soliciting him for some kind of support. This is how he's lived his life every day. The Bible says that Peter said to him, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And powerfully, this lame man stands up by the power of God and he's raised up and begins to walk. Well, you would think everybody would be excited about it, but there's, once again, there are those Sadducees, there are those scribes, and there are those religious critics that are looking at everything that's being done, and they still don't get it. But the power of God is being released because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter and John now empowered. Peter who denied Jesus three times the night in which Jesus was betrayed is now filled with the Spirit of God in Acts chapter 2 and empowered in proclaiming the gospel, the gospel of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we see this in Acts chapter 4. One of the things that characterizes that, that early and emerging church, that birth of a new people, are people that are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The book of Acts records this for us in Acts chapter 4 because they gather themselves together and they are bold in the Spirit of God. They begin to pray and they begin to seek the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with great boldness. So one of the, one of the things that we see about the resurrection is that now these, these newfound people, this new group of people, the church, the ecclesia, that they are filled with the Spirit of God and they are bold in the Spirit of God. And so the resurrection produced a people who were emboldened now at the price of even laying down their life, they're emboldened to go out and to share the gospel. This boldness of the Spirit was not something that was natural. It was something that was supernatural. And the Holy Spirit of God impacted them and filled them and, and, and caused them to stand and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. We see this in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4. And what becomes, what becomes apparent is that these new believers are being empowered by the Holy Spirit. The church was empowered to soar in the face of adversity, just like we're being challenged today, to soar in the face of adversity. And when you see these, this newfound group of believers associating themselves together, they gathered themselves together. At first they were fearful, they were unsure, they didn't know what to expect. Maybe like some of you today. But what happened was they understood the importance of unity and togetherness. And in the face of suffering, we see them uniting in fellowship. Peter and John are called into question and they're brought before the authorities and they wanna know by whose authority are they healing this lame man. And they make it very clear, it's not by their authority, but it's by the authority that comes through Jesus Christ, the resurrected Jesus, okay? And if you read Acts chapter two and three and four, you see very carefully, mark the number of times where it speaks about the resurrection and the boldness of the Spirit of God that came upon them because they decide 
even though they're rebuked and told not to say anything more, to go out and, you know, they're released because naturally the religious leaders know they can't deny what's happened, right? And the people have seen it. I mean, they know this man who's been healed laid at the gate called Beautiful. They know that this man's been laying there every single day. They've seen him. Nobody can deny he has been healed. So they couldn't argue with that, but they just told him, hey, we're going to release you. But you cannot go out and say anything more about this. And what the Bible says here is that Peter and John answered them and said, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. But we cannot help but speak of the things that we've seen and we've heard. In other words, it doesn't matter what authority tells us when it comes to speaking the name of the resurrected King. We must speak His name. We are compelled. In fact, we are filled by the Spirit of God so that we will in boldness proclaim the name of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus empowers us to be the people he's called us to be and to suffer well together. And in the face of suffering, share our burdens with one another and unburden ourselves with all the fears and the entanglements of this world. So God's people were filled with the Spirit of God. But one of the interesting things that you see there in Acts chapter four is that when they were filled with the Spirit of God, after they had prayed together and, and the place was shook up and the power of God was released and, and, they, and they sensed God's presence in a great way, the scripture says this, interesting enough, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and no one said any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Here you have the resurrection of Christ, which is central. Without it, we, our, our faith is, well, there is no faith. It's completely undermined. And we see that the resurrection produces this new life in Christ. That was the power of Christ to release us from our death, to release us from hell, to release us from, from the fear of death and the fear of anything for that matter, to be, to be overcomers. The resurrection, it produced life in Christ. In fact, it was the resurrection, which was the singular event in human history that conquered death and brought life. Without the resurrection of Jesus, our faith is without foundation. And so the gospel, the gospel of Jesus is contained in his death and in his resurrection. That's the complete story. Jesus died for us. And in doing so, he died in our place. Because Jesus died for us, he paid a price for us that we could not pay for ourselves. And his Father in heaven, God our Father, justified us. He declared us to be right, in fact, when we had always been wrong. But the power of the resurrection did something even greater. It released us from the shame and the guilt of our own sin. Christ accomplished for us a victory that we could not accomplish for ourselves. He paid for us a way that we could not pay for ourselves. He was the one who was the first fruits from the dead, raised from the dead with the hope now for all who follow him and believe in him that we too would be raised from the dead. You see, the resurrection is that singular event in human history that changed everything. It was the day, truly, that changed the course of humanity. While we may look to the fall as a day that caused the landslide of humanity and the brokenness of humanity, and we can trace that back to the story in Genesis, the reality is, is that while that story is real and dark, we have a glorious and hopeful day in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We lamented on Good Friday the fact that Jesus died for us. He died because we sinned and because we have, the Bible says we have all sinned and the result of our sin is that we pay the price of death. But today is not a day of lament. Today is a day of hope. It's a day in which we look death in the face and we tell it it no longer has authority in our life.
because of the resurrection, that singular event changed the course of human history. And because of that, you and I have hope. It was Martin Luther in response to the black death in Europe who said this, we are here alone with the deacons, but Christ is present too, that we may not be alone and he will triumph in us over that old serpent, murderer and author of sin. However much he may bruise Christ's heel, pray for us and farewell. The early church suffered much, but they also shared much and tucked right into the middle of Acts is not only a declaration concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but it's the statement how that they shared what the Lord had given them, they shared. The full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and not one of them said that the things that they possessed was their own. And then this great statement about the resurrection, Verse 34 says, There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land and homes sold them and brought the proceeds of what they sold, and they laid it at the apostles' feet, and they distributed those things to each person as they had need. What that means is this, is that the implications of the resurrection meant that for these early believers is that they shared their life. They shared their suffering. And that suffering is either going to cause you, it's either going to shape your life or it's going to sour your life. If you decide to hoard the things that God's given you, what good is that? When our brothers and sisters in Christ need, we can help them. They sold their things to make sure that each person in their midst was taken care of. We see this radical kind of generosity occurring, this generosity toward believers that we see. And ultimately, the legitimacy of the church today is going to be tested based upon the fact that we are willing to display this kind of love and kindness toward one another. How can we say we love God when we don't even love our brother that we see? So many implications to this. In fact, here at First Family, we're challenging you to be generous. We're and not just generous, but to be radically generous and to give our first care fund or benevolence fund is there for us to be able to give to and all of those monies will be given so that we can take care of our brothers and sisters in Christ who may be losing their jobs, who may be suffering because of the illness. We're here. That's why we're here. And if we can't stand as the body of Christ today in that kind of way, then one could question the legitimacy of this faith that we say we believe. And so if the church is going to be the church more than ever before, we have this opportunity to actually share the gospel of Christ in tangible ways. Rodney Stark in his book called The Rise of Christianity details very specifically how Christianity was surging during times of plagues and famines and so forth. He's a Christian sociologist which helps us to observe what took place when Christianity ran to the battle as opposed to fleeing out of fear. It's an interesting point because what he suggests is that, is that when Christianity understood its commitment to the mission, to sharing the love of Christ and sharing the resurrection power of Christ, is that when they committed to that in the face of fear, they were able to stand with great hope. This is what the resurrection does for us. It helps us to see that. And we see in the early church that when they grasped the mission and they understood the foundation of the resurrection, that they were committed to it so much so that they began to share the possessions which had been given to them and they sold those possessions and tucked right into the middle of the conversation of how God's people were, were caring for each other is this message that, that the resurrection is the day that changed everything. It changed everything. And in the face of our fears today, we are able to stare down our fears. We're able to stare down death itself simply by declaring the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As a church, we're going to be committed in these days like never before to a radical kind of generosity, one that compels us and that tells us to go to the front of the battle and to care for those, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. And with our first care ministry that you and I and this church family are committed to and that I challenge you to give to, 
that you would give radically in these days, not simply to the budget and the, the needs of our ongoing uh, ministry here at the church, but I'm talking to the first care ministry, our benevolence ministry, where we care for one another. That commitment to that is absolutely essential in order for the church to demonstrate the legitimacy of our faith. And in light of all that we're facing in these days, there's never been a greater opportunity for us to share the gospel with our friends and with our neighbors and with our family members. Family members that maybe today we'll have lunch with, but this evening we will dine with our ancestors like one Italian wrote, writer uh, wrote in the 14th century when he was describing the Black Plague. And he said that very thing, that at lunch they dined with their friends but in the evening, they dined with their ancestors in paradise. It could be that real for us. But as Christians, we don't have to be afraid of death, do we? Because Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. This message today that we can share, that we can declare to our friends and our family is a message of hope in the face of death and discouragement, in the face of this unquantifiable, unknown virus that we don't know what to do with. But it's not the first time that humanity has been faced with this kind of challenge. And it's not the first time that we as Christians have been faced with this type of challenge when we would give of ourselves and we would share this gospel of the resurrection of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was that day, 2000 years ago, it was that day that was the day that changed everything in our lives. I hope and pray that you'll share that message with people that are all around you. In fact, I pray today that if you're listening with us, that you would join us in committing your life and your heart to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the moment in time that we can share the love of Christ and that we can glorify our Father in heaven who raised up His Son from the dead and who will do the very same thing for us. This is the time for us to become historical. That is anchoring our faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not in the hysterical mo notions of this day and time. It's in this moment in time that we must demonstrate our love and not some kind of glib sentiment sentimentality. It's in this moment in time that we must show a radical kind of generosity and not the selfishness that consumes a, a flesh that gravitates toward me, myself, and I, and just that which is around me. It is in this moment in time that if you want an Easter to remember that you would declare hope and stop spreading this virus of fear that is consuming so many people's lives. The resurrection of Jesus Christ witnessed on at least 10 occasions tells us that there is hope for those who believe in Jesus. Today is your day. It's your moment to grasp and to lay hold of this hope that Jesus offers to you as a gift. Not fear, but hope. A hope that will sustain you beyond this moment. It's anchored in history, truth, resurrection power, but also takes you and bridges this moment to the future that God has for you if you will trust in Him. God's plan is an amazing plan. And I know that there are skeptics out there. Not long ago, I was visiting with someone who really doubted the authenticity of Christianity. And many really sought to destroy Christianity because they felt like, well, this resurrection of Jesus, that really the women, they went to the wrong tomb is what has been suggested. Many different ideas that they went to the wrong tomb and, that, and that's why they didn't find Jesus there at the tomb. Other ideas suggest that, that did Jesus really die in fact or was that just something that was, that was made up? Did, did these followers of Jesus, did they really die for a lie? Would they have really given their life? Would you take someone like Saul, a murderer, who would then become a missionary if he didn't believe and have evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? These truths are indisputable if you will look and you will reason and you allow the Spirit of God to flood your heart. We believe in the resurrection, not because we are simply hopeful, but we believe in the resurrection and it's the resurrection which gives us that hopeful attitude and that hopeful out, out, outlook in life. You don't know Christ as your Savior. Why don't you confess Him? It'd be the greatest gift that you could receive today, this gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. 
I ask you now, what's keeping you from trusting Jesus as your Savior on this, the greatest day of hope and the day that changed everything else in history? you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you
Thank you for joining Home Church today. We miss you greatly. In fact, we can't wait until we can actually see each other and embrace each other again. But we're grateful for this opportunity. We can share a little bit of life together. And so we pray that as God is working in your life, you'll let us know what kinds of decisions that you're making or questions that you might have. Reach out to our pastoral team. Let us know. We'll reach back out to you and answer any questions that you might have. Well, I hope you have a great week. And until next time, may God bless you.